All right, well, good morning, everyone, and I appreciate everyone joining us this morning. My name is Tom Robbins. Uh, I'm with Kentigo, and I want to thank everyone for joining our webinar on responsive design and using Kentigo CMS 7. Uh, you really, you know, don't have to, to live under a rock to see how exciting mobile, uh, mobile applications are these days and responsive design is clearly on the top of, of everyone's mind and it's something that uh, I know we think about a, a lot, especially as we looked at how we were building out the next generation of Kentigo CMS. So we put together this webinar in conjunction with eCentric Arts who's one of Kentigo's premier partners uh, and has a, an incredible amount of experience around how you build mobile applications using responsive design. And I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Michael Kincaid from eCentric Arts, who has a ton of experience and who's been kind enough to join us for about the next hour and, and uh, cover some of his experience and some of the other information uh, around uh, responsive design. So without further ado, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Cheers, Tom. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the, the introduction. Sure. And uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming on board and joining us for this uh, webinar on responsive web design. It's a big stack, and there's a lot to cover, so we'll just get straight into it. Uh, these slides will be available um, after the webinar, so you can come back and, and have a look. Okay, so today's agenda. Uh, today, we're going to do quick introductions because I'm not on my own. Uh, I'm I have Mark Stiebelhurst, who is a fantastic uh, designer and uh, user experience developer with me, so I'll be introducing him. Uh, we're going to cover what is responsive web design. We'll be looking at approaches to responsive design as there's a, a couple of different technologies in play here. Uh, we're going to look at it from the perspective of design as well, how you actually go about putting the design into responsive. We're going to look at available tools and frameworks. Uh, responsive web design has been out for a few years now, and there are some great tools and frameworks that you can use on your projects and in uh, you know, Kentigo CMS projects as well. We're going to look um, at the new Kentigo CMS 7 mobile features and discuss where responsive fits in uh, with these new features. And then we're going to look at uh, a bit of a summary piece to respond or, or not to respond, and really the sort of considerations that we certainly have uh, at eCentric Arts whenever we approach projects and, and how to determine whether or not responsive is going to be the right fit for that. And then finally, we'll open the floor up uh, for some Q&A. So first of all, just some introductions. So as Tom mentioned, we are eCentric Arts. Uh, we're an interactive studio that creates award-winning user experiences for web and mobile web, like you read. Uh, we were based in Toronto, Canada, and have a uh, you know, long and rich history, 12 years, as you can see on the infographic, creating you know, superlative digital solutions for all sorts of clients, small, you know, medium, large, Fortune 500, uh, and all sorts of areas as well, media, healthcare, corporate, uh, government, culture, Associations, not-for-profit, I could go on, broad spectrum, lots of verticals. We've been using Kentigo CMS now for, I think, around four years. Uh, this year alone, we will release around 40 Kentigo projects, and we, we love the platform, and we're certainly thrilled to be presenting you know, our, our first webinar for Kentigo. Uh, obviously, I have to do some shameless self-promotion, um, and obviously I won't be doing this again. So first of all, just let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Michael Kincaid. I'm the head of application development here at Eastcentric Arts. Uh, I'm a certified Kentigo trainer and also a certified developer. And you'll know me when I'm talking by my Northern Irish accent. Um, I'll be presenting some of the initial points on our agenda. Uh, but like all you know, application developers, I know when to shut up and pass the baton to uh, the experts. And the expert, certainly in this case, is my companion, Mark Staplehurst. Um, Mark is a, a senior creative and um, user experience designer, developer, and an all-round front-end wizard. Um, you'll know Mark by his lovely English accent. We only have one headset hooked up today, so I'm just going to get him to yell hello. There you go. So if you hear that accent, you know that's, that's Mark. Um, we're on Twitter if you want to follow us, um, because really my mom is the only person who follows me. And ask us questions, then feel free to do so. So enough of the promotion. Let's get stuck right in. What is responsive design? 
So the good old days. Uh, you know, once upon a time, in days long gone, there was really only one way to view the internet, and this was on a, a desktop monitor. Laptop phones don't count as they were terrible. Um, back in these days, a designer would typically aim to have their work look great on an 800 pixel by 600 pixel screen, or if the client was fancy, uh, they could upsize the you know 1024 by by 768. All in all, you were you were designing for one layout and you were targeting one very well-known device. Your main battle was really with browser differences, um, you know, a battle we are now well armed for thanks to many of the frameworks like jQuery. Leapfrog over a couple of uh, iPod versions, Ulster winning the Heineken Cup a few times, had to drop that in. Uh, and the present day picture, you know, it, it really couldn't be uh, more different. You know, a user can now access their favorite online content on a, on a whole range of devices each with different screen sizes, uh, you've got a, a whole new language of touch and swipe, and also you've got multiple orientations as well. Uh, now, the browser on many of these devices, you know, they are just as powerful as those find on desktop computers. You've got pinch and zoom features. You know, with these, a mobile user can navigate your site with a little effort um, and some considerable squinting as well. So when faced with a mobile requirement, the temptation would be to just you know, keep the desktop design and present that to all site visitors, irrespective of the device they're using. You know, they, can, they can zoom in. Uh, this, however, we feel is a, is a pretty naff idea for several reasons. A naff idea because. First and foremost, you know, I think it leads to a less than enthralling user experience. If you browse a site you know, designed only for desktop for a long time, uh, frustrations tend to grow. And you can see here you know, my mathematics of frustration. Um, you know, zooming in and out to navigate gets tiring. Forms are a real pain to work with. And often forms, quite frankly, just don't work. Um, all in all, you can expect you know, higher frustration, less conversions you know, from things like form submissions. And in the end, you know, a higher bounce rate. And there's good statistics for that for visitors who basically you know, they leave poor mobile websites and, and bounce off the competitors that have actually put a bit of consideration into the user experience. Uh, just creating one fixed design also flies in the face of, you know, tried and true design principles. The main one here is to design specifically for the medium. You know, a three inch screen is far, or five, is far different from a 17 inch monitor. You know, there, there is a missed opportunity in not embracing this fact. There's also a broader language now than just clicks, as I mentioned earlier. Users can tap, they can pinch, they can swipe. A design or online interaction you know, should make use of this new vocabulary. Finally, there's also the point about page load, which we're going to discuss today. You know, if you have one site design built for desktop, then the page size is likely quite heavy, or at least best consumed with a high-speed internet connection. And users on a mobile device are frankly not going to thank you for all the bloats and delayed page load when all they want is to find your contact details. So what, what is a web company to do? You know, do you build N sites or N devices? This is where responsive design comes to the rescue. Uh, responsive design is a technique that was first introduced a couple of years ago. Um, and it, it seeks to solve the problem of a million devices by creating designs that really optimize themselves for the viewing device. And it was championed by Ethan Marcotti, and there's a link here to his article on a list apart, which everyone you know should really read. Responsive advocates, you know, one build, one responsive design, and getting support for you know end devices. And this is accomplished with uh, you know CSS magic for older browsers. We also have some help from JavaScript. And just to give you an example as to what we're talking about today, for those who are not that familiar with Responsive, um, I've got obviously some sites that we've built. Have a look here at our eCentric Arts website, which was released I think about a year ago, Mark. Yeah. Um, this website is Responsive. If you came here on a mobile device, it would look different, but it's the same. This is the same Kentigo site. It's the same Kentigo content tree. We're just using responsive techniques so that whenever somebody comes on the desktop, it looks like this. You get to mobile, you'll see it looks like that. So it's reformatting. Got all the same content. Or it could be hiding content. But really, this is the responsive technique. 
Another site, uh, we've got Newborn Free, and I wanted to show this out just because you, know, you can actually look at how interactives can change and adapt and how this is actually beneficial because you're, you're going to make it more of an engaging experience for the user. We have this scroller here, we've got some text, we've got an image, um, but if I resize down to mobile, you'll see that we're now changing the way it looks. Um, we have these little buttons here, we don't need the text, so we have that there, so it's, again it's reformatted. Um, and the final one I wanted to show was one that we just released, um, I think it got Kentucky side of the month as well, that's another bit of shameless promotion, sorry I said I wasn't going to do that. Um, and this is for Entertainment One. This one's quite interesting because with this, the responsive approach wasn't uh, to actually go down, it was more to go up. Um, and by that, I can show you here, sort of standard monitor size. You'll see that I've got three things across here, I've got four along there. E1 wanted to have a, you know, a dramatic impact on large monitors because you know, they have those in their, their office. Um, I'm using for presentations as well. So whenever you have a bigger screen, we actually we respond up the ways. You'll see there's interactives have changed, and I four across the whole screen, and the contents and the design has changed to fit the new device size. So really, that's that's an idea of responsive and what it is, and that's what we're going to discuss today. And just wanted to give one more shout out as well to a site that's just released, and that's Microsoft.com. So for Anybody who thinks, you know, is this responsive thing really going to take off? Um, you know, the big guns, Sony, Microsoft, are beginning to implement this. And this is Microsoft's new site. We've got desktop. We've got a bit of mobile for, or got a bit of tablet formatting there. Let's see, Discover goes down, and then we've got the mobile. So we think this is a great approach, and you can see by people who are beginning to implement it that it is beginning to take off. So let's get into approaches to responsive design. So there are three main ingredients. Um, first one is media queries. Second one is fluid layouts or grids. And the third one is uh, fluid media. And these can be separate, they can be combined. Um, Mark's going to come in and talk about tools and frameworks and you'll, you'll get to see you know, examples of all of these. Um, all I'm going to do is actually show out you know, the actual technical side of it and how it's done. So let's look at media queries first of all. Uh, and here's just a quote from you know, W3C on this standard. They say, by using media queries, presentations can be tailored to a specific range of output devices without changing the content itself. So let's look at media queries. Again, ability to target media devices with specific CSS. It was first introduced in CSS2. And there's a link here to the W3 specification where you can actually go and do the deep dive and it's really good bedtime reading. Those specs are dense. Um, and here's an example of, of how it was introduced in CSS2. So here you'll see that I have two style sheets. Style sheets, as everybody knows, styles the page. Uh, it's in a language called CSS. Uh, the first one here you'll see is media screen. And if the device fits that profile, as in desktop, then I'm going to load um, this x.css file. If somebody wants to print and they click the print button, then the browser is going to load, if it's available, you know, this print style sheet, which is underneath. So this is a, an example of how it was first introduced. Um, we were using different style sheets for different user actions, browsing the site, printing the content. And again, it's, you know, you're, you're designing it for the, for the medium, the medium of print, the medium of, of the screen. Let's flash forward now to media queries in CSS3, and this is really where responsive starts to take shape. So in CSS3, we now have the ability to target screen sizes. You'll see here I've got an example property max width. Um, and I'm saying media screen and max width of 600 pixels. So advice with the maximum width of 600 pixels, if this style is going to be applied. You can also do advanced queries with ranges. Um, there's max width, there's min width, there's um, all sorts of different properties. So I can combo these up and actually say, right, I'm interested in, in loading this CSS when the screen size is, say, you know, between 600 pixels and 900 pixels. You know, it's a great way of targeting various different tablet sizes. You've got, you know, the iPad mini might be coming out, the full iPad, different Samsung uh, notebooks. Media queries in CSS3, we also have the ability to target orientation. Um, so if you've got a mobile phone, you browse a site that's unresponsive design, 
and the designer and the developers have, have put this into consideration, then you can actually you know, make different CSS load based on the orientation of the device. And you'll see here how you do that um, just with the orientation property between portrait and landscape. Finally, um, a thing to discuss in media queries, and this is, I think this is really cool, is responsive delivery. Uh, a lot of people you know, will complain about responsive and say things like, oh, but you have to load up you know, this, this massive amount of CSS. Um, you don't have to do that. You can use responsive delivery. If you specify media query in your link to your style sheet, then the device will only load the appropriate style sheet and not the rest. So if I have background images, for example, uh, within that style sheet, only the appropriate background images will be loaded. So yeah, again, only target CSS loaded, only media link in the CSS is loaded. Fluid layout and grids. This is an approach that uses percentages to ensure that the media scales appropriately. Um, so you'll see here, you know, I've got width 80%. I can I can resize the browser. This element is always going to occupy that space. And then finally, I have uh, fluid media, which is similar to the slide previously about the fluid approach. It's the same concept whereby I actually specify a percentage on media, like an image, and then whenever the browser is, is resized or I'm actually on a different device, that image will occupy the appropriate space. Um, this is enough chatter from the developer. I'll be back soon uh, to show responsive in Kentigo, but I'm not going to pass it on to uh, Mark Stablehurst, who is uh, our senior creative. So, Mark, over to you. Thanks, Michael. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to get my headset on. Okay, great. So, um, so Michael, that's, uh, that was a great introduction to sort of um, the founding principles of responsive design. Um, I just wanted to step in. Um, and talk about perhaps some of the design considerations and, and then also some of the tools and frame, frameworks that we use here at Accenture Cards to build a responsive site. Okay. Um, so a little bit about my background, I'm a, um, I'm a front-end developer and a designer. Um, I do work with Kentico every day with, um, alongside the application developers here at Accenture Cards and I, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I know my way around a a transformation or two, but I wouldn't um, I wouldn't touch .NET code um, ordinarily. So, really, um, my my background is is more HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, as well as uh, design principles, Photoshop, and mockups, layouts, that sort of thing. So, um, I wanted to just have a quick look at um, our our approaches to responsive design in terms of a visual um, a visual approach and how we go about mocking up a design. It's quite tricky. It sort of changed the way um, web design is approached, responsive design. Um, you know, it used to be that we would typically fix width, the layout, um, center it um, you know, within the browser, um, and cut graphics uh, that were you know that were very uh, that had very specific um, widths and heights, pixel-based layouts. Um, that sort of changed. Now we're considering multiple uh, widths, uh, multiple uh, structured layouts. So. Typically, we start with sketches, um, just kind of very simple ideas around, you know, what where content should appear on the page. Um, obviously, that that changes depending on what kind of device you're viewing um, your website on. So it, it just really helps to strip back and um, and look at blocks in terms of more of an IA wireframe um, before you start a layout. Um, we also uh, typically you know, when you were uh, designing. Um, Historically, you would use something like Photoshop. Um, that would be your main tool um, for design. Um, and the problem, problem with Photoshop, obviously, is it's a photo manipulating software suite. So it, again, it's it's tools. It's not really set up for things like responsive or dynamic layout. So what we're finding more and more now as we're approaching work at Centric Arts uh, from a design perspective is that we we typically just define a fairly structured. Um, layout guide, style guide, um, to get sort of a sense of the look and feel of the site. And then we'll iterate on that once we start development. Um, it's more of an agile approach where um, instead of um, just having the design laid out perfectly um, in a comp before build, um, there's more back and forth between the designers and developers. Um, so yeah, definitely more elements, fewer templates, uh, focusing more on the specifics, uh, and then letting the layout breathe um, 
once we get into development. Um, so then I also wanted to go into some of the tools and frameworks um, that we use from a front-end perspective. Once design is, is finished, once we're pretty happy with the look and feel, um, we then start um, bringing in libraries and helpers to essentially get us up off the ground. Um, now, responsive design isn't really, a, um, you know, we've seen it's, it's nothing hugely groundbreaking in terms of technology. It's really um, the idea of, um, of a layout that responds, that's fluid and dynamic, has been around for quite some time. Um, Jeffrey Zeldman, who runs the, um, the Alista Park uh, organization that are responsible for that, uh, the, the seminal article on responsive design, um, I mean, really sort of um, makes the point that liquid web design has been around for a very long time. Um, it's just that we've improved on it greatly, this new approach. Um, it's just the reason it's improved is um, we have um, more tools now um, at our disposal that are essentially richer and more developed. The HTML5 um, spec and technologies combined with CSS3 style markup um, have really enabled us to, to create much more rich, um, richer in experiences without having to resort to um, cut graphics and fixed widths. Um, so I would definitely recommend, although responsive design doesn't require HTML5, obviously you could still use HTML4 um, and just use CSS3 alongside it. Um, I would really recommend that you, that, um, that you begin with HTML5 in your front-end um, approach. I mean, as, as I said, CSS3, you'll need media queries from that, um, from the CS3, CSS3 spec uh, to implement the responsive design. But there are features of HTML5 that will really help um, if you do want a richer responsive layout. Um, and if you aren't, um, if you haven't really started many projects in HTML5 or you're, you're looking to learn more about HTML5, I really recommend the HTML Web Designers book. Um, it is also free online in web form. Um, you can look through, it's a fantastic resource, again, it's from the Alistair Park group who are really sort of becoming champions of responsive design and they're, they're a real great go-to for, um, for, for articles and also resources. So, as I said, starting with HTML5, um, after reading, reading up on it, uh, or if you're already familiar with it, just ma you know, make sure that you're leveraging as many of its latest, uh, the latest features available within the technology. Uh, I, we use at Eccentric Gods, when we were beginning, when we were ramping up, we used HTML5 Doctor to essentially go through all of the new elements uh, and make sure we understood them properly, uh, that we were laying out our site um, semantically um, and uh, using the appropriate elements. This is a great resource. When we, our first responsive um, site was actually the Eccentric Arts website, and that was also when we were beginning HTML5 and CSS3 um, technology, we're integrating that within our, um, within our approach. So um, a lot of this kind of happened at the same time for us, um, but it's been really, really sort of essential um, in uh, adapting responsive design is making sure that we're using the latest and greatest bleeding edge technology, uh, but responsibly. And as I'm mentioning, responsibly browser support, it's really um, helpful to know there's a great project called HTML5, please, uh, which sort of lists all of the um, all of the new features provided by HTML5 and CSS3 along with a sort of a green, yellow, red caution flag um, letting you know if it's safe to use it um, responsibly. You know, if, if, if the, the browser vendors are at a point when you can essentially rely on them having implemented it fully, um, that your website will render cross-browser across Firefox and Chrome and um, Opera, Internet Explorer. Um, you know, as, as we're saying, uh, responsive design relies heavily on media queries. If I just scroll down to look at CSS3 media queries, I remember my alphabet. Here we go. Um, we can see that uh, it's got a green flag of use. Um, some of them are green with a caveat of use polyfill or use with fallback. Fallback. We'll get into that later. But a, a, just a straight green is just um, is that's really reassuring that you're that you're pretty that you can be very confident that. Uh, this is something that will work uh, reliably. Uh, you can actually click on each of these um, definitions and it'll give you a little bit more information about the new uh, feature in, in HTML5 or CSS3 along with a sort of um, um, some of the, the, the details about that technology and how to implement it. So it's a really great resource, I'd recommend. 
Um, then the next thing we do when we, we start a new, any new project now in, in house, but especially with responsive designs, um, is we begin with HTML5 boilerplate, which is um, a great starting point for front end development. It's um, essentially a, um, um, a, da a download which contains um, all that you need to get up and to get up and running um, in the front end. Um, it you know, includes reset styles for CSS. It includes um, JavaScript libraries like jQuery. Just all of the the great, the, all the latest and greatest um, uh, technologies for a front end build. We've um, just to kind of go in a little bit more about how, the way HTML file boilerplate um, is set up. There are three varieties um, in when you when you download a build. There's the classic HTML5, which is sort of a bare bones, stripped back, um, hipster fixed wheel bike. You know, it's it's really up to you. If you're given the the, um, the the most the purest form of it. Um, it's up to you then to put in the work um, to in implement your design. Um, you've got a solid base. Uh, you've got then the middle tier responsive, uh, which is again a, just a, it's a great place um, to go for a starting point um, for a responsive design and then finally you've got the bootstrap which is you know which which has all the bells and whistles the kitchen sink of um, front-end development and it includes a library called bootstrap developed by Twitter again we'll go in that we'll go into that a little bit just to access this point uh, to access these choices in HTML5 boilerplate if I jump back to the project and if I hit get a custom build um, it'll send me to initializer which is there are a lot of projects in HTML5 and CSS3 because it's a very new technology. There are a lot of different groups that have popped up, a lot of different standards, a lot of different open source projects, um, and uh, there isn't one right approach. That's one of the sort of things that people get confused about, I think, in responsive design, is they think that um, it's a, uh, a prescriptive list of technologies that you'll need to implement, but really it's more just an idea um, of how to approach web design. So there is no, there is no right and wrong, um, just essentially yeah, that was one of the challenges we find was just finding the, the tool sets and the frameworks that were mature enough and that, that had enough activity that were developed um, really with standards in mind that we could use responsibly. So Initializer has, has basically is an offshoot of the HTML5 boiler project. They began to roll in all these different projects, all these different frameworks into one really simple uh, build setup web page. You essentially go here when you start your HTML5 project and pick between those three flavors I've mentioned, classic HTML5 boilerplate, responsive, or bootstrap. As I say, classic five, uh, HTML5 boilerplate, you can sort of see what, what it's made up of. Um, they're including, we'll get into all this a little bit later, but they're including modernizer, they're including jQuery, and then um, IE conditional star sheets, Google Chrome Analytics, all the things that you, you'll, um, that um, we would get reprimanded for, for forgetting before a launch. Um, it's a great check. Uh, you know, it saves a paper. You don't have to write a checklist. It's just got everything that you'll that you'll forget uh, before a launch. Things like uh, robots text and humans text and so on. Um, so that's the bare bones. Responsive, you'll notice, just essentially changes your check boxes. So it includes um, respond.js, a mobile first responsive CSS star sheet. Um, but pretty much that's the difference. As I say, that's that's just giving you a head start and getting a responsive design off the ground. And then finally, uh, Bootstrap um, really only changes um, the fact that uh, the responsive Bootstrap styles are included um, for grid, grid systems and so on. We'll get into that a little bit later. So again, a great resource to get started. Um, so breaking down some of what's involved in these tool sets and these frameworks, uh, things that, again, we had to wrap our heads around when we were beginning to move into responsive layouts and design. Uh, grid systems, we weren't you know, we were using grid systems in our Photoshop layouts. Um, obviously, it's a great way of ensuring uh, a layout is um, consistent across different templates. Uh, it also helps for visual literacy, visual literacy, making sure the page scans nicely. Uh, grid systems have been around a long time, I think since the medieval ages, in terms of print layouts. Um, but they've only recently started to take um, on um, a great head of steam in um, CSS. Uh, as I said, we were using them in Photoshop layouts, uh, but um, only in the last couple of years or so, we, we've essentially been using grid systems um, in CSS too. Uh, 
the uh, the golden standard in the industry for a long time in terms of grid systems um, for CSS was the 960 grid system. Um, if I if I just pop open that project, it, I'm sure maybe um, there are people who have been have have used this before. It's um, as I say, it's 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 very mature. Um, it was the go-to for a long time. You can kind of see in this page how it's laid out. We've got grids here. Um, stacked um, horizontally, here's a three, uh, three column layout, uh, here's a two, and they've got little um, uh, screenshots, you can actually click show grid to see how designs um, fall onto these grid systems, you can kind of see on this one, for example, this feature banner uh, stretches the entire width, whereas um, there's a left hand column that runs, uh, it's like eight columns, and then a right hand column that runs seven. It's um, Really, uh, as I say, it's been around a long time, um, but it's been superseded now in responsive layouts um, because it's structured, it's fixed, it's a fixed layout grid. Um, so as we, as we were mentioning, responsive design uses flexible layouts, um, and it has evolved, that project has evolved into uh, Adapt.js, it's actually linked from the web, uh, from the site. Um, if I jump to Adapt.js here, there's a GitHub project that's running currently that um, will change the layout based on your mobile, uh, your, based on your device width. Something Michael was saying, we can download star sheets um, based on your media width. So um, in this case, we've got a whole range from mobile up to 2, 520. It's the same grid system, but just with wider values um, for the columns and gutters. So that's where um, 960 has ended up. Uh, there are offshoots of that. Uh, Fluid 960 is a really interested one, interesting one, but again, uses the same mathematics, um, but scales it up in the browser. We can see here, if I rescale, um, we've got um, a full Fluid layout. So um, another great, another play that's open, that's open source too. You can download those star sheets before you get going, and it's just something that you need to work with your designer in tandem, make sure the designer understands that it really helps your, um, your development effort to make sure that designs and mockups are on a strict grid system. That way you can let the grid essentially do most of the work in adapting to your media width. Um, if you make sure content is structured in that way, uh, laid out in that way, you can just scale um, percentage based and, and, allow the, and allow the web browser to adapt the content within it using, using percentages. Um, so then there are a couple others, that is, as I said, that's a, um, we've been mentioning fixed and fluid a lot, that's another thing that we had a little bit of confusion about when we were beginning uh, responsive designs. Uh, there are, oops, sorry, I jumped in. there are um, two approaches when it comes to responsive layouts that often um, people differentiate it to by calling it adaptive or responsive. Uh, adaptive layouts, essentially a fixed width layouts. Um, here's an example of another grid system, CSS grid system framework called the 978, which uses slightly different mathematics in its column width sizes and gutters to 960. Um, you can see here's the, um, here's the standard desktop version that would run on a typical 1024 by 768 and above um, monitor on a desktop. Um, it's it's fixed at this point, and if I drag, it'll switch to 1218 for widescreen monitors. And if I and, um, 1378, it keeps going up again. Um, that's I think the maximum width in this framework. Um, it also goes down to 748, 300 for mobile. Um, just changing the column widths, but you can see that it's not actually scaling the column widths in a percentage-based way. It's fixing them. Um, so that's and this is an adaptive layout as opposed to a responsive one. The numbers seem arbitrary once you get into it, um, 12, 18, um, 960, essentially um, it's down to numbers, statistics, averages, uh, device width and screen widths change constantly. Uh, there is actually a school of philosophy in web design now that you essentially lay out your, your design um, in the way that, that makes sense visually as opposed to worrying about the, the, the pixel numbers. Um, there are some good guidelines. Typically, we use 480 pixels for mobile layouts, and either 960 or 978 for desktop layouts. Um, but um, between that, between that, all the other breaking points. I mean, uh, iPhone, the iPhone 4, 3, 4 um, have a different a device width. The iPhone 5 
there are so many other devices that are that are that are um, off. You know, they're within a range. Uh, okay, and then finally, um, so Bootstrap. Uh, we'll get into it again. Um, that was the third option when you start your your um, HTML5 project. They offer their own grid system to Bootstrap. It's just a fantastic um, toolkit to essentially get get off the ground uh, using all the latest technologies. They include a great deal of um, of components and tools in their in their framework. Just one of those is their grid system. You can see it here. Here's a, uh, I'm linking directly to their example. They've got they actually use a hybrid approach of adaptive and responsive. So um, as I'm as I'm hitting the different breakpoints, uh, the grid is adapting. Um, in a fixed way, and then once I get to um, to a single column layout, it's actually doing it um, responsively with a, a percentage base scale. Okay, uh, we also mentioned flexible media. Um, I'm just going to just jump through this really quickly. Uh, the, sli the slide deck. Um, if you are using uh, rich media in your web design, video, audio, or any kind of um, web, any typography that isn't Vedana, Arial, you know, the standard web fonts, uh, it's really helpful to use, again, the latest technologies um, so that it'll work nicely within your responsive design. Just to run through it really quickly, um, video and audio have come a long way in the HTML5 specification. Another great reason to use HTML5 as opposed to HTML4. You don't have to rely on Flash anymore. Uh, you can use um, uh, HTML5 video. At Eccentric Arts, we use typically we have um, if we're using if the if the videos are stored um, on our own servers. If we want to use our own video players, and we don't want to use a content delivery network like YouTube or Vimeo. Uh, we want to roll our own. We want to build something custom. We'll use either JW Player or Media Element, two great HTML5 technologies that are on that are on um, that are currently available and sort of leading the for, leading at the forefront. Um, YouTube and Vimeo both provide HTML5 players alongside their Flash players, um, as well as um, SoundCloud. They also offer both HTML5 and Flash. And the reason I mention um, mention this is flexible media is important, so we need to be able to scale the video and audio to adapt within the layouts. Um, but also, one of the great benefits of responsive design is obviously that it works on mobile devices. Um, it's a shame uh, to, to cut yourself short um, by using Flash technology that will not that will not work on most Apple iOS devices, so as I say, um, use HTML5 video if you can. Uh, it's definitely a benefit. Uh, web fonts well have come a very long way since um, HTML4 and CSS2. Um, there are now incredible libraries um, and uh, services available to use um, typography that typically you'd have to cut graphics for. Uh, Typekit, Google Fonts, and Font Deck are all great resources. Typekit was one of the very first. has a really mature um, set of typefaces that are that are optimized for screen uh, display. Um, Google Fonts is free. Uh, they have a decent, a very decent collection now that you can use within your layouts. And Font Deck too is is catching up um, with licensed Foundry fonts that were typically unavailable um, as web fonts. This is, uh, again, as a result of uh, CSS3's font face, as well as some great JavaScript libraries that optimize and create fallbacks for, um, for type on the web. It has, I mean, the, the, one, of the other, and one of the reasons why we have to use type um, uh, HTML CS3, CSS3 type is because um, you'll essentially want to change the size of your headline um, and body text to um, optimize the layout for a mobile or a tablet design. Um, you want to be able to do that with pixel percentage values as opposed to scaling rasterized cut graphics. Um, CSS3 has also come a long way, so just to kind of go through um, some of the features that we, we, we use um, extensively in our layouts um, that really um, are beneficial for responsive layouts. Rounded corners, drop shadows, gradients, opacities, and text shadows are, are all now available within CSS3 spec. Again, something that you wouldn't be able to do uh, traditionally um, is apply those effects um, purely in the browser. You'd have to cut graphics or use uh, jQuery to, uh, or JavaScript, some JavaScript libraries to achieve them. Um, 
UCSS3 now, it's a great, um, uh, it's a great way of creating a rich layout um, that again you can optimize for the the, the width of your of the width of your um, uh, of your mockup. Uh, for example, um, on mobile layouts, uh, you may not want to use drop shadows or gradients if you think it's too busy. It's just a line of CSS to strip that out. Uh, finally, uh, just uh, some JavaScript tools that we use. Um, as we've been mentioning, all these latest, greatest tools. Um, obviously, if you are worried about, um, you should be worried about all the legacy support for all the browsers. We use Modernizer. It's included in that HTML5 boilerplate build. Uh, we use Modernizer um, as essentially a, um, a library to detect uh, all the browsers and essentially give them um, a way of supporting the new features. Um, with a, a, in, a, in a, just a pure JavaScript fallback way. Um, it's a really, really powerful toolkit um, and we, rec we recommend that we use it in all our projects. Um, it just essentially levels the playing field for browsers like IE7, IE8, um, IE9 even, um, and all the versions of Firefox and Chrome, etc. Uh, if you don't want to use Modernizer and you think it's too heavy, it does do a great deal of um, uh, feature detection, polyfills, uh, which essentially are just little fallback um, scripts that allow you to use um, specific CSS3 and HTML5 HTML features. You can use um, smaller libraries like HTML5 Shiv, um, which allows you to use HTML5 elements like articles and headers, etc. Um, head, head tags, sorry, or footer tags. Uh, there's respond.js, which um, provides um, I6, I2, I2, IE8 support for media queries. Uh, there's the alternative CSS3 media queries library. They're both uh, competing in terms of, um, of offering that support. And then finally, um, we use jQuery as our um, base standard um, DOM manipulation JavaScript library. It's fantastic. Uh, it's included again in the HTML5 boilerplate project. Um, alongside the basic jQuery library, there's a suite of plugins that are developed um, out there in the community that are, that are fantastic and worth using in your projects. Um, fit vids, um, you know, we talked about HTML5 video um, and making sure that you can use video in mobile layouts and mobile devices. Fit vids will scale your, um, your embeds, your YouTube and video videos or JW player embeds uh, responsibly. Uh, fit text is for headline text. When you're using web fonts, it'll scale those down proportionally. Flex slider is a great um, a great content carousel slider that we that we use in a lot of our projects. Um, again, just to show you, for example, flex slider. Um, we've got um, images scaling depending on your layout. Um, it's a lot of work to actually get plugins like this uh, to respond to media query breakpoints, uh, making sure that it does it gracefully. Um, so uh, libraries like this really help minimize development time. Um, and then again, Bootstrap I mentioned is great, um, a great library. They come to that comes to with a great set of jQuery um, plugins such as um, alerts or car car carousels too. They have um, a whole suite that that responsively adapts. And very finally, just for some inspiration, um, some great sites to go to. The Boston Globe was one of the very first sites that went responsive that had um, a, a huge uh, vi uh, visit account. Um, it's worth checking out. Um, I'm not um, endorsing the, um, the uh, nomination, but uh, Barack Obama's website is responsively designed. You should check that out too. That's a fantastic uh, piece of design work. Uh, Google's online safety guide and uh, just finally media queries um, which is just essentially a gallery of all the latest and greatest responsive layouts. Uh, uh, this is a real, when we were starting designing responsive sites this was our go-to for checking out um, responsive designs and what's, a bit, what's really possible within the browser. So I'll just pass over to Michael to, to wrap up some of the features of um, of Kentico and working with responsive designs. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, Mark. That was excellent. Um, just before bouncing into Kentico, I just wanted to call out a feature of the Chrome Developer Tools, which I really like to use, uh, which you can actually just, if you do, fire it up, 
go to the little configuration at the bottom, you'll see overrides. Uh, this is handy if you're doing any server-side detection. You can actually set your user agent, set the metrics of the page. Um, And you'll see that it sent the right user agent in, and it's actually it's responding. Okay, just going to close down a few windows here. Well, wow, Mark, that's a lot of frameworks. That's a lot of tools. <laughs> okay, so let's get into Kentco. So new Kentco CMS seven mobile features. Uh, most of you, if not all of you, will be aware. Uh, last month, Kentco released their latest and greatest. Uh, version Kentico 7, which has got a fantastic suite of brand new features. Um, that workflow automation blew my mind. Anyway, these are the features that were specific to mobile. And I just want to quickly go over them and then we're going to go into a bit of a demo. First of all, you need to turn the features on, so make sure that you do that. You'll see them in uh, the site manager settings, content, content management. There's uh, three settings. There's device profiles, layout mapping, and uh, image resizing based on the device profile. So let's discuss some of the features. Uh, the first one that you'll notice is map shared layouts. And these replace shared page layouts with uh, device specific shared layouts, which a bit cheekily here is handy if you use shared layouts. Um, we don't use them that much, um, but you will be able to see whenever you're on a device profile that you create, and by device profile I mean something like you know an iPhone or an iPad. Um, I can actually go and specify that if the default is the full page layout, then please map this to a row layout. Uh, this is something that we, we haven't yet used yet, um, but we're we're having a look at the moments. Um, the features coming up are ones that we have started to play with. So this next one is page layouts for devices. Um, here you can pick a page. You can select a device, iPod or an iPad, and you can create a device-specific variant of that template. So I have a template for the default device. You'll see here that I didn't create a template for the iPad, iPad device layout not defined. However, if I want to create a specific Kentigo page template with zones and web parts for an iPad, I can do that by just clicking on Create Device Layout. Um, and I'll show you an implementation of this. The next feature that I think was really attractive to us, and we're, and we're, we're definitely going to play with this a bit more, is conditional templates. Um, it really, you know, it's, it's going to depend on the nature of the gig. If you have a mobile requirement and that mobile site is really different from you know, the full site, something like page layouts is going to make a lot of sense because the variation between the device template and the default template is really high. If you're using more of a responsive approach, the likelihood is if you've done responsive, you're probably used to saying display none in your CSS to hide interactives or things from you know, different devices that you don't want to show. Uh, but again, you're still making the user load all the content. With something like conditional templates, I can actually specify you know, regions of my template and, and say that they should be associated with a certain device profile or not. So here you'll see I've got a div with iPad only HTML. Um, I have a conditional layout uh, control here, and I'm, I'm saying you know only make this content visible for the iPad. Um, this definitely is something that we think is you know a really cool feature. As you'll notice, however, all of the features um, that I've talked about in record fast time um, rely on server side detection, and I'm sure the responsive purists are, are sucking in air and are getting ready to, to ask really mean questions to us. Um, please be nice. How do we marry the two together? Should we marry the two together? Um, there's a, a bit of chatter on the wire about a, a new hybrid approach, and this is certainly something that, that we're using at the moment, and it's called REST. And that's responsive design and server-side components. Uh, it's a bit of a no-brainer. It just makes sense. So what is it? Uh, first of all, credit to Luke Robolowski. Apologies for totally destroying your surname. Um, but if you look at this link, this goes over what REST is. I think it's the first person I ever saw really do a good article about it. Um, and really, it combines the best of responsive design with server-side detection. From responsive, we get you know responsive UI. We get responsive delivery of CSS and background images, but we use server-side detection to be able to deliver 
you know, and target HTML and functionality. There's no point in giving the iPad, you know, our huge, big, full default HTML page if really, you know, two thirds of that doesn't need to come down the wire. We can make it a better experience and a snappier experience for the user by at least giving them the HTML they require. We're already doing that with the CSS through Responsive. Um, and that means we can also ensure delivery of sized media by requesting images through you know, handlers. You can actually say, if the device is this, then please get this file. Um, it's a bit of a hack because really we would like the browser to be able to determine this. You've got a little link here, wherefore art thy o picture tag. Uh, similar to the way HTML5 does video, be really cool if we could get, you know, markup like this, where we have a picture tag, we have a variety of sources with media queries that then tell the browser which image to actually load. Um, that would be great, but we're a wee bit away from that. So let's just have a look. Um, I've got a demo here of Canticle 7, where I've actually used Twitter Bootstrap. So you'll see here that if I scale, Oops, come on. We have a bit of a mobile look. We've got probably that's what tablet maybe, and then we've got full screen. So if I just go into Canto here, I just want to show uh, the features that that we are really excited about. So if we come in here, you'll see that I've just got two pages, um, and I'm just going to have a look at the templates. So I just got ping or something. Um, I have. A home page, and if we go to design and have a look at the actual template, you'll see I've got my markup. And in here, I have uh, conditional layouts where it's called the Page Hero group. If you're the iPad, I want you to get this content. If you're the iPhone, I want you to get this. Uh, you get the idea. So, this is an example of using conditional layouts. I have one page layout, and I'm using conditional layouts to actually uh, define what's going to get showed. Uh, if I go to preview, I go to iPad, again you'll see it's the iPad Hero that loads up. Um, if I go to iPhone, it's the iPhone Hero that loads up. So we're combining responsive design with uh, server-side detection here. If the iPad Mini comes out and we're not actually targeting it, we haven't registered that as a device profile, you don't need to worry. Responsive is going to cover that. Those users are going to get the best experience possible. Um, if we want to start doing more targeted uh, features, then we can use the server-side components to do that. Just to quickly show uh, the other approach, here I have uh, the About page. And if I go to actually go to Properties here and edit the template, here I'm using device layouts. So I have my default layout. You'll see that I have my web part zone. I've got spanning it across the entire page. but I can also create and manage independently from that device specific templates. Here I have my iPad zone. Now I have the same zone main in here and that means that content and web parts are going to be shared between these templates. But I can also specify unique web part zones and then only those web parts within that unique zone will show to this device um, on the iPad. And I can show that if I go into the preview. I'll just go to the default. So default, Lorem Ipsum, go to iPad. I have the exact same Lorem Ipsum, so if I change that, both are going to get it. But I'm also bringing in an ICHTML5 video um, just for the iPad as well. So you get the idea that the examples are a bit convoluted, but you know um, that shows the, the different features. And we definitely think that you know, Kentucky is going to be a great framework to combine responsive with uh, server-side components as well. It also does uh, image manipulation with being able to send down uh, you know, a well-sized image for the different device profiles. That's the feature you can turn on. Okay, so finally, to respond or not to respond, that is the question. You know, overall, as web developers, uh, there are many approaches to mobile. Um, you have native mobile applications, you've got fun and games of mobile-specific subsites, and then you've got responsive websites. You know, how do you how do you pick between them? Overall, I think you know part of the the conversation you need to have internally is how important is mobile traffic uh, to the services that you provide as a digital solutions provider. Um, you can't really argue with the the trends in terms of you know mobile traffic. If you look at articles like this KPCB uh, 2012 trend, it really has shot up. 
you know, I think you know the UK is on about, and don't call me these numbers, maybe 15% of mobile data. If India is to be believed, I think more people are accessing online content with mobile devices than desktop. Um, you know, and it's a it's a significantly you know growing market. It's it's it gets bigger every year. So you can't argue it it is you know something we need to consider. Um, also, on a site by site basis, definitely now we're looking at our analytics. Uh, we're engaging clients and having conversations with them that go along the lines of, are you aware that 35% of all the traffic to your site is on a mobile device and that people are jumping off at these certain points? If we look at you know just the funnel visualization. Um, and, and really, if we look at the experience they're having, it's subpar. We need to address that. Overall, I think as a, as a provider of digital solutions, you need to start taking mobile seriously now. Um, you know, for everyone who's joined this webinar, it's obvious that you are doing that. Um, and just really quickly, how to distinguish between them. At Extent Regards, this is how we would consider it. We go native if we require the native API. We can't get away with using PhoneGap. Um, we want to make some money in the App Store. And also if it fits the budget. Uh, mobile subsites, we've definitely done a lot of these before we really got into responsive. And certainly now that Kentico has these new features for conditional layouts, um, we can move more with responsive and Kentico. But we'd still use them if the site already existed. If the mobile experience was not the complete site, um, obviously if the client just needs a two-pager, then it may be quicker just to do a mobile subsite and not use a responsive design. Um, also, if everyone is okay to manage two sitemaps, because that will be the consequence of doing that. And again, if it fits in the budget. And then responsive design, finally. Um, for us, we're always going to consider this if it's a fresh, clean, shiny new build. Um, we're going to see if we can if we can introduce it. If the entire sitemap is available, irrespective of the device, then responsive is the way you want to go. If you don't want to limit support for and targeted devices, again, server-side detection is great. I can say, oh, act like this on an iPhone, act like this on an iPad. But you know, four weeks from now or three weeks, if we were to believe, or if we were to believe them, you know, the iPad Mini is coming out. Um, really, the responsive is the best foundation to, to hit all devices. As Mark said, you just consider the design rather than worrying about all the different pixel sizes. Um, also, if you if you want to manage content in one place, you know you publish once, and everybody gets that content. You're not having to manage two trees. Again, you should always consider the budget. So, in conclusion, hooray! It's 12:01. We didn't do too bad here, Mark. Um, responsive is not the only approach. However, and you knew that was going to appear. Um, we do feel that new tools and frameworks make it the best foundation, you know, for supporting multiple devices. And certainly combining that with the server-side techniques, as we outlined in the rest, um, you know, it becomes really powerful. And another thing to take note of is that you know, people like Microsoft are using it, and companies like Google are now recommending responsive design for SEO. You know, give me one URL, give me one page. Um, obviously, you can do dynamic content if you want. Um, but they, if you click this link, you can read an article about you know, what their thoughts are on responsive design. Um, so, yes, Q&A. Um, I think, Tom, do you have time for some questions from the purists and the skeptics? I think we do. We can take yeah. a few minutes. Okay. I know you have one question. Uh, someone was looking to see the uh, master page, I think, in the Bootstrap site you were showing. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, no, it was just quickly thrown in, but I'll, if I learned to spell, I can open it up. That's okay. okay. So again, we just really we just dumped this in. Um, you'll see here we have uh, our two CSS files coming in. Um, I could put a media query on there to be a bit better about how it loads in. But we've got the Bootstrap and we've got the Bootstrap responsive. Um, and then within here, I've just got my main zone where I've got my page container. So we didn't cut this up too much, but it's not, you know, it, getting bootstrap into a site, uh, into a Kentico build is, is really quick and easy to do. Um, again, shameless promotion on my part. Uh, for my portfolio site, I used uh, Kentico 6, and I also used uh, Twitter bootstrap as well. Um, obviously, the server's gone sleepy, so that, that didn't work at all. 
Um, so yeah, it's not that difficult to put in. You can see here, it's quite easy. And then whenever I go down to something like the home page, if I have a look at the template with Bootstrap, you're using things like you know uh, different classes like fluid, and I can say span, which will let it know you know how many of the actual columns of the grid that this should take. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know the horizontal width before we get it gutter, and then I've got span nine. So really, that's it's it's not difficult to put it in. Here we go. Yeah. So this is responsive as well. So this is Bootstrap, and also I'm using uh, Cantigo. So things like the menu are you know dynamically loaded from the content tree, stuff like that. So we've got a mobile breakpoint, iPads, and then full screen. Go we, uh, one of the other questions, how concerned are you with integrating sites with all these third-party pieces? Question uh, from well, somebody. Yeah, uh, no, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, speaking for the front-end developers, anything that really becomes part of our framework does go through the ringer quite a lot in terms of how we test it internally um, and through you know, our internal QA process. And we do our own R&D on these things, it doesn't get into a project until we really have a good comfort level with it. Um, so it will, anything like that has to be, you know, it gets brought up, we'll discuss it, we brainstorm it, we'll do a little, you know, sort of skunk works project, and then we'll introduce it properly into the, you know, into actually our suite of tools. I think it's just, it's like anything, you know, you, you have to move with the times, you can't sort of stay stagnant, but you have to make smart, responsible decisions for your clients. So things like modernizer, you know, We'll play around with them whenever they're in alpha, but they'll not get introduced to client solutions until you know they're, they're really into version one. jQuery Mobile is a good example of that. Like it was so tempting to use something like jQuery Mobile um, whenever it was in alpha, but we, we didn't do that until it, you know had an actual full and proper release. So again, you, you know, a bit of common sense. Okay, great. Well, we're we're getting towards the end. How about uh, if people had more information? As I've told a few, we'll go ahead and post up the link for your deck. Um, and uh, I guess one last question, which I think is good: Is it possible to build responsively with all versions of Kentico CMS, or only the most? Uh, I guess the most recent version. And I'll let you, you answer build, that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, totally, you can build responsibly. Responsively. Um, with any version of, of Cantigo, um, really, there's not you know that much of a problem. You might like there's ideally you want to be able to change the top doc type so you can get into HTML5. And I think I'm not sure. I think you've been able to do that for quite a lot, quite a while now in Cantigo. But really, it's responsive design. The title is a bit of a giveaway. It's a it's a design and a front end consideration. What Cantigo is going to provide um, is it's going to provide a, a great suite of server side detection and device profiles. For clients as well, I think a really big win with Canticle 7 is this new preview feature. Um, this is going to be fantastic whenever it comes to our, our clients actually creating content and using our page templates and doc types and so on, and being able to actually preview you know, how it's going to look on these devices, whereas previously you're saying, oh, grab the side of your, your browser and, and resize it. It's not, not obviously the best. So Canticle, you know, you can use responsive on any version. Certainly, Kentico 7 really takes it up a level in terms of how clients can, can manage responsive content and how we can add in all the bells and whistles of, of device detection. Okay, great. Now, I know we're, we're about five minutes over time, but I think there's time for one more shameless self-promotion in case people oh, yeah. are interested in uh, you know, getting in touch with you or finding out more information. Um, where could yeah. they, they follow you on Twitter? You know, maybe that kind of thing. I, I'll do the corporate if you um, just let me get to the slide. So if you look at this slide here, um, we will send the link out. You can see at the bottom the various ways in which uh, people can contact us at Eccentric Arts. There's contact us at Eccentric Arts phone number. Certainly follow us uh, on Twitter as well. Um, EccentricArts.com is our website. Uh, you please go there and check us out. And then for myself and Mark, uh, you can ping us on Twitter if you want and send us any of your questions. We're more than happy. Uh, to, to reply. Excellent. Well, I want to thank uh, Michael and Mark for, for joining me today and, and providing some great information. Uh, as, as, uh, as Michael said, we're going to make the slide deck available and, and hopefully we won't have any technical issues and I've, we've been recording this and we'll be able to post that up as well. Uh, and if they have any questions, uh, please take a look at, at eCentrics Art sites 
And uh, with that, uh, thank you, Michael and uh, Mark, for joining us. And uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Cheers, folks. Thank you. Thanks, All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.